Um, thanks, Richard. Um, so the goal of this project is to demonstrate a 40% efficient concentrating um, PV submodule using commercial concentrated solar cells. It's been a collaboration between the University of New South Wales, um, led, the group's been led by Martin Green, um, and an Australian company called Raygen Resources, and two US outfits, uh, Spectralab um, and NREL. And the NREL collaboration in particular has been facilitated by the Aussie APV um, uh, umbrella uh, uh, support. Um, I did want to clarify what I mean by some of the terms before moving on, um, because this, this work's received a little bit of attention in the media. Martin's done a few interviews here and there. Um, Submodule um, in, in this context means um, we're including the optics losses in our efficiency results we're presenting and sub, the, word, the, the, the prefix sub means um, that it's under 800 square centimetres. So that's sort of the cutoff mark. Anything over 800 square centimetres gets the um, word module attached to it. Um, okay, so I'll move on. So the motivation for the work that um, Martin identified this opportunity um, in 2009 when he saw this result from Spectralab uh, commercial triple junction cells waste a significant amount of energy in the germanium subcell of the triple cell stack. So if you can split some of those photons off that are otherwise wasted, split them off to a silicon solar cell, you can benefit in efficiency improvements as well as reduced heat load. And that's important for concentrator or high concentration um, PV applications. So just to differentiate between the two types of spectrum splitting, um, Triple junction cells already uh, exhibit or, or use vertical spectrum splitting. So they're made of a monolithic stack of three different types of semiconductors ordered in from high, high band gap to low band gap. And that filters the light as it passes through. Lateral spectrum splitting, which is what we're introducing in, in this work, is the idea of having an external filter added to the receiver to split the light off to a, a separate um, silicon solar cell in this case. So here's some um, simple modelling results of the effect of spectrum splitting on the light OV curve. So without spectrum splitting, the germanium subcell cell is strongly overdriven um, in terms of current compared to the current limiting subcell of the triple junction stack. With spectrum splitting, you utilise this wasted energy. Uh, you convert it at higher uh, voltage in a silicon cell and provided you do that without too much detriment to the triple junction cell, you get this uh, shaded region as an extra output of your receiver. Um, the second motivation, uh, the second thing that motivated Martin to be interested in this work was, well, um, there's a potential application for this work. In 2008, an Australian company, Solar Systems, demonstrated the world's first concentrator um, PV power tower system. And that um, consists of a field of heliostats shown from behind here that focuses the light to this um, tower and there's a one square metre uh, receiver uh, of triple junction, a dense array of triple junction solar cells at that receiver. So you've got a relatively large collecting area um, focusing the light to a relatively small receiver. So the, the idea of swapping out that receiver for a spectrum splitting receiver like the one shown here could be, could be a practical approach. Uh, this receiver, um, we just refer to it as a V-shaped spectrum splitting receiver for obvious reasons. Um, it has the, the bandpass filter um, as a cover glass on the silicon array and that reflects most of the light to the triple junction array um, but lets some through to the silicon array. Okay, so I did want to mention that Solar System subsequently decided to focus on their dish technology um, but that's um, the power tower technology is being furthered by Australian company Raygen Resources. They um, were formed in 2010 from some of the key people from solar systems who wanted to pursue this power tower approach. So this, show, this is a, an artist impression of their system that they're developing. It consists of 64 wireless heliostats that focus the light to a receiver on top of this um, simple mast um, structure. So in t uh, when was it? This year, earlier this year, they received uh, a big contract with a, a Chinese company called China Intense Solar, um, a great name for a concentrator PV company, to, to install a 10 megawatt, so that's a commercial scale system, 
in China um, by late 2016. So the power tower technology um, is moving along quite well and that's, that's where we see a potential application of our spectrum splitting idea. Okay, so what we're doing in, in this project is to um, design and fabricate a prototype spectrum splitting submodule using commercial solar cells. So the solar cells we're using are these one square centimetre cells from Spectrolab. They're the triple junction cells that if you measure the cell alone under concentration, that's the efficiency, 38 and a half. Behind some optics that of course lowers. So we're looking at the performance as at about 37%. The silicon cells were fabricated by SunPower and packaged and supplied to us by uh, Enia in Italy. They're, they're high performance concentrated silicon cells. This shows the, um, oh I should mention that we connect the cells, so it's, our prototype consists of one cell of each type, so one square centimetre cells of each type, um, connected independently, so it's a four terminal configuration. And that has benefits for efficiency output as well as uh, energy yield in a, in a system um, application. So this shows the external quantum efficiency of the cells we used in the actual prototype. So the three subcells of the triple junction, the silicon cell, and this is the wavelength region here from ni about 900 to 1050 nanometers where we want to split the light off to the silicon cell. Um, just notice the broad um, wavelength range that the, res the, the devices operate over from 350 nanometers up to 1850 nanometers. That's a huge spectral range. Okay, so our prototype uh, optical design was facilitated by a 3D ray tracing analysis using a package called ZMAX. Um, and our, our design consists of an 8 inch diameter uh, parabolic mirror that focuses the light onto a receiver. That distance, the focal length is about, is, is a metre. So that's the sort of size I'm talking about of a prototype, a metre long um, submodule. The receiver um, consists in close-up, consists of the, the mounts that hold the, the solar cells, so one for the silicon, one for the triple junction, and the all-important spectrum splitting filter. Now there's a tilt on the, on the mirror just to keep the uh, receiver from blocking the incident beam. There's also a tilt on the filter, again to avoid blocking and shading. So the minimum we, we worked with, uh, we thought we could get away with is 23 degrees. Ideally you'd have normal angle of incidence. These filters work best um, at, at low angles of incidence. So 23 was our design spec. Um, the receiver also uses a, an optional uh, secondary optic element, these, these truncated reflective pyramids. They're widely used in the concentrator cell industry already. So we, we had them as an option to improve flux uniformity if we needed to do that. So we can focus the light, if we put the solar cell at the focal point of the mirror and, and capture the whole beam, or we can defocus to improve the uniformity if we, need, if we need to do that. So overall we get a very high optics efficiency, optical efficiency with this, this arrangement. It's relatively simple, um, and it, in, in a sense it emulates a power tower system. It's, it's basically uh, mirrors, involves mirrors, um, for the optics. Okay, so mechanically the, the, the prototype consists of three main components. We have this metre long optics rail. At one end we have the primary mirror that concentrates the light and that's held in a gimbal mount. The other end is the, the receiver that is supported by a, a range of different translation and rotation stages. Here's the cell mount um, for the two different cells and the all important um, spectrum splitting um, filter. The, all these rotation and translation stages are important because we have, a, a, while we have a robust mechanical design, we have full adjustability so we can optimise the, the thing when, while we're doing on-sun testing and that's, that's been important. Okay, so the cells are mounted on a custom-made heatsink, um, so that allows us to contact the cells and also actively cool the cells. Um, I think, okay, this is the picture of the silicon cell um, in, in, indoors. This is an outdoor picture during testing of the triple junction cell. So you can see the full beam capture, the white spot there, and something that people in the silicon and like maybe the OPV field don't see is this, this red photoluminescence from the cell. When it gets intense light on it, it lumin luminesces, and that's a fun thing to see. Um, we did develop the secondary optic element, which was an optional um, component. We, we, we built it, we 
tried it on the prototype, but it didn't give an improvement. So it wasn't used in the final, final design or the final prototype. So all important, we want very high efficiency optics in this system. So we wanted high reflectance, preferably over 97%. We did that with an enhanced silver coating provided by an, an Australian company. And this, this graph shows how, how well they match their predicted value. So the reflectance is pretty well over 97% over most of that broad spectral range. Remember, it's quite a broad range. So the most important component of the prototype is the spectrum splitting filter. It has to operate over uh, the broad wavelength range and be highly reflective over all of that range. So this is transmission plot, but reflection is 100 minus that. So it has to be near perfect or um, over, especially the short wavelengths where you don't want it to detract from the triple junction top subcells. The, and we need a very well-defined bandpass region. And we work closely with the filter supplier, Omega Optic, Optics, um, they're a US company. Um, to refine the design of this, the, the cut on, the cut off wavelengths, we tweaked that, uh, I think, through six iter iterations with them, with what they could actually fabricate um, and, um, yeah, going back and forward with that design. So this plot shows their theory versus what they actually achieved. Um, they measured themselves and we measured. Um, it's a remarkable achievement, I think, um, to, g to get that sort of high-quality filter over such a broad wavelength range. So this is a close-up of that. It shows there, are s there is a little bit of structure in the bandpass region due to the non-zero angle of incidence um, and these are polarization effects cause this. So the filter switches on a little bit earlier than we, than we desire. Um, but that's okay because we, we have some tunability in the filter pass band because of the fact that we can tweak the angle of incidence. This shows that we can redshift the pass band by going to lower angles of incidence. Um, anything lower than 15 degrees we start um, one component blocks another in the, in the prototype, so we can't go lower than that. But this, this shift is enough to, to get us away from this um, middle subcell response region. See here, it's chipping into it, but we can move that away from there. Okay, so basically we're going from a three junction receiver, shown here, to a, whoops, next one, um, four junction receiver, including the independent silicon solar cell. So this is some pictures of uh, the prototype being tested outdoors on one of the, um, oh, in this building, yes, um, in late October, where we did some, um, the final bits of testing here. Um, we had to establish a, a capability to measure the prototype here. We didn't have that before, so we've got a telescope tracker set up there to track the sun, um, a chiller to actively cool the solar cells, per heliometer that measures the direct irradiance and that's fixed to the side of the prototype there and a custom made light IV curve tracer that can rapidly switch between measuring the silicon cell and the triple junction cell. Um, that's a better picture of the prototype itself showing the mirror and the receiver and the receiver there showing the re reflected light hits the triple junction cell and the transmitted light in the infrared um, goes to the silicon uh, cell. So the best results we achieved here were in, um, when's that, 22nd of October, um, of just over 40%. Uh, this table shows the measured parameters of the, of the um, prototype of the triple junction cell and the silicon cell, and the sum of those power outputs or efficiencies give the final result there. So that was very promising for us to get that result. And we had the uh, prototype independently confirmed at NREL in the, in the US. Um, and these results were given back to us only um, re a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't expect you to read the fine print, but the upshot is that their result confirmed our result essentially, and with a result of over 40% efficiency when you sum the outputs of the two, two devices. As far as we know, that's the highest um, efficiency module of any PV technology and it's the first to exceed 40 percent and that's that's why Martin's been getting a bit of um, media publicity about this result. So this is a um, what we've achieved with the prototype. Um, where, we, where can we take that? Well we're, we're, we've begun a feasibility study of applying that spectrum splitting to a power tower system. So again remember just swap, swap that flat receiver to this V-shaped spectrum splitting receiver. Uh, we've again been using this 3D ray tracing package to, to do some optics modelling of the system. Um, that's the receiver there um, that shows 
the same as the sch schematic earlier, the, the filters on top of the cover glass on the silicon array. And the triple junction array, which you've, which you've paid for anyway, is, is, a, is a part of that system. So this allows us to look at issues like uh, optical efficiency, um, flux uniformity over the, the arrays, uh, angle of incidence effects on the filter, and also spectral effects from, from time of day and season, etc. So this is some, some initial results that just show that uh, with the flat receiver, we get a very high optical efficiency. I mean, we're assuming 97% reflective mirrors in this system. 95% is actually quite realistic. Um, but in any case, in going to the V-shaped receiver, the spectrum splitting receiver, we, we get only a tiny, tiny loss. And that's basically because of light that goes into the receiver and bounces in the wrong way and comes back out. So it's escape reflectance. So that's looking very promising. We're not hurting the optics efficient, optical efficiency too much. Um, flux uniformity, this just shows the flux maps of a flat receiver and the two receivers in the spectrum splitting receiver. When we have the most simple pointing strategy, all the heliostats in our model point to the centre of the receiver. Um, and they're all focused at the centre of, of the receiver, the simplest case. So you can, you can um, get rows of those heliostats or even individually to focus at different um, focal lengths and at different places on that receiver to improve the flux uniformity. And to some extent, you can also accommodate that flux non-uniformity um, uh, ad by adapting the cell interconnection scheme, so the series parallel connection of the cells to, to cope with the non-uniformity. So, so that's looking quite promising, that modelling. And OK, so just in conclusion, we've, we've demonstrated a spectrum splitting prototype sub-module over 40% efficient. That's demonstrated the proof of concept of this approach. Um, and also we've looked, starting to look at possible applications in a PV power tower. So thanks, thanks for your attention. Yeah, I'm taking over from Richard, but are there any questions? Yeah, you Congratulations for this <coughs> excellent result. Now, you have an excellent splitting of the around about 800 to 1100 towards the silicon. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious why you still only get 4.7% uh, from the, your silicon cell. I, I, I thought that you could have uh, even higher. Uh, we, we, well, it depends on how much uh, excess germanium response there is in the triple junction cells. And that varies um, depending on um, the, the, the cells. So Spectralab, the ones they happen to supply us, had so much response. And we could only take, you know, four to five milliamps from that. So in, in, the, next round, we're, we're in the next round, we're hoping to get to 42% and ideally we'll get some more suited cells from, from our partner Spectralab that have a more excess germanium response. They don't, they don't optimise these triple junction cells for the germanium response. That's, they've got way too much already. So yeah, if we can get cells with more germanium response, we can tap off more to the silicon cell to get more output. Mark also did the calculation that silicon cells are actually converting 43.1% of the energy that's actually falling on it. So, so it's doing quite a good job. Yeah. Probably, probably better than, than the other cells in this cell. Yeah, actually it looks quite bad when it's just 4% from this 26% cell. What's, what's wrong with this? You know, but yeah, it's 43% effective conversion. Sorry, I should have said that. Mark, the environmental stability of that spectrum splitter, is that, is, how is it made? Is it at the, at the, we, we've been using a front surface filter, so you know, for environmental reasons, you might want to use a rear surface one and you'd, to protect it, and you'd, you'd cop a 4% loss, I guess, from, from that. But you know, that's something we can test. Yeah. Your space cells use a um, infrared filter on uh, cover bars, so that's quite a standard product for space cells. So we imagine they've done a lot of moisture and durability testing for them. Mark, uh, What's the anticipated concentration factor of the, of the heliostat field that you use? Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned that. So our prototype concentrated the light 365 times. The um, field that Raygen is working on, that 200 kilowatt system, is 750x. And is that limit with the, with the cells? Is there a concentration limit on those cells? Um, the cells we've got um, were designed for 500x and 200x, the silicon ones. The, um, but, but you can, you know, you, you rejig the, the, the grid, the contacts, to, to go to higher concentration. 
Yeah, so there's, there's triple junction cells out there now that can handle 1,000x, no problem. Okay, cool. Thank you, Mark. Once again. Okay. Thanks, Mark.